Right, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to a, a new session of evening lectures with Edinburgh Jolsock. Good to see everybody here. Um, I hope uh, those who were able enjoyed their pizza and pop upstairs. Um, I'm going to do a, a very quick introduction because on this occasion, uh, John, John McDonald here, is here to receive our acknowledgement uh, uh, recognition uh, in terms of the Clough Memorial Award. So I'm going to hand over to Mark as our president to do the, the honours as far as that is concerned in a moment. But um, I'm, uh, in terms of the lecture that John will give, I, I'm delighted to be able to uh, start off the session I in with a topic which um, maybe some of you wouldn't have thought would be kind of our normal um, raison d'etre, our normal sort of material as it were. So we're going to hear tonight about someone who has, as we'll hear in a moment, ranged across a whole lot of geological experience, geological disciplines in his career to date, uh, starting with some of the very oldest rocks that we have in this country and into some of the very youngest uh, materials that we're dealing with geologically. Uh, and so I really look forward to, to John's lecture um, and uh, I'm sure it'll uh, <sighs> illustrate to you why the society wanted to uh, recognize John's work with the Clough Memorial Award. So I'm going to hand over to Mark to uh, make that award uh, and uh, then we'll crack on with uh, the rest of the lecture. Thanks, Graham. Thank you. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, the Clough Memorial Award is made every two years to a, um, a relatively young uh, researcher um, of outstanding merit, basically. So that's our basic criteria, so congratulations. Um, so just talking to you briefly beforehand, um, so those of you who don't know, I'm actually from Scunthorpe, uh, which is infamous uh, for its steelworks and uh, its piles of slag. Um, so this is a talk I hope is going to be dear to my heart. Um, now this is the point where I suddenly wish I had a big cardboard check um, or something that I could, or a medal or a cup or almost anything that I could actually hand to you, but I actually um, it's, uh, the, the award is basically money, uh, which nobody ever turns down. Um, but unfortunately, it was moved, I understand, by electronic um, transfer, which means there's nothing actually to pass over, apart from my congratulations and a handshake. So thank you very much. Okay, yeah, congratulations, John. Thank you. Um, right, um, same format as we always do. Uh, questions at the end of uh, John's lecture, and uh, then we'll, we'll uh, hand over to you, John. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much um, for the kind words of uh, introduction. Very um, delighted to have been nominated and to have received um, the Clough Memorial Award, and looking forward, actually, just to kind of chatting to you about some, I guess, aspects of geology, of geoscience that maybe we don't often think about um, so much. So Graham tells me in the society we have a very uh, well-read um, audience, um, likes to be challenged, maybe not with like some minutiae of techniques, and I, I hope that uh, tonight's talk kind of um, hits those boxes because I'm not going to go into any crazy technical detail, but hope to challenge you by talking about some very different geology to perhaps what we're we're used to thinking about. And this is very modern stuff, as, as Graham and Mark have alluded to in their introduction. I'm going to be talking about um, what I call anthropogenic geomaterials, mineralogical materials that we as humans um, create, um, and then how they can then go into creating new rocks over the last sort of 100 years or so. So very much. Um, the, the latest part of the geological record. I'm going to try and use um, as much as possible examples from, from Scotland, um, you know, to kind of uh, hopefully engage our, our local audience, some slightly further afield in terms of the north of England, but there's lots of great stuff in terms of understanding this kind of anthropogenic geology that we can do in our local area. Um, you know, it's my name on the award, but there's so many other people that have contributed in various ways to some of the stuff I'm going to show here today. I think I've maybe got everyone in this extensive list uh, in the bottom right of the screen. Um, apologies to anyone who sees this who thinks they should be on it but aren't. Um, but yeah, so just to, to acknowledge that. 
So I thought I'd maybe just start um, by saying a bit about how I got to end up studying and researching these kinds of things, this kind of anthropogenic geology, because it's already something, you know, when you go to university to do a geology degree, um, that you really get taught about very much, certainly not when I was a student. Um, and so I kind of started in a very sort of classical um, geology, geoscience background. My first foray into research in my PhD was looking at rocks from the Lewisian Nice Complex, so oldest rocks in the UK and northwestern Europe, um, in northwest Scotland. And, you know, I was very much into um, geochronology, but geochemistry, doing some field work, you know, all the kind of great stuff that a sort of keen graduate wanting to do uh, research into a PhD um, does. So, you know, that kind of uh, went fairly well. Did my PhD in, in Liverpool, um, based in Liverpool, supervised by John Wheeler, but also with uh, supervision here in Edinburgh. So Catherine Goodenough, who's pleased to see her tonight. Uh, also Simon Harley from uh, here in the School of Geosciences. Um, and, you know, spent quite a bit of time in Edinburgh during my PhD um, doing, uh, particularly working in the Dine Microprobe um, facility uh, here in, in the school. And so a lot of my work then in the, the PhD kind of focused on, on zircon dating and zircon geochemistry. Um, so essentially trying to work out, um, as many have done before and many have done since, um, ages of these really old metamorphic um, tectonothermal, we might call them, events, um, affecting the rocks that we find in the Lewisian Nice Complex in northwest Scotland. Not easy to do, not going to lie to you. Um, the panel in the top right shows some data, but it's just in a bit of a smear. We'd be looking for some nice clusters there, not so much. Basically, pick an age, any age, over about a billion years, and you will find it somewhere in a zircon from the Lewisian Nice Complex. Some stuff, though, kind of made some interesting advances using some different kind of microscopic uh, techniques, looking at crystallography of, of minerals, in this case the zircon, and understanding how when crystals can become deformed or bent, their crystal lattice is becoming bent, then that could cause um, diffusion of elements which then disrupts um, the geochronology. So that was nice, very much liked working in the in the Northwest Highlands, um, family connections there, so it's always a, always a plus point, lots of great fun experiences in the field, lots of great uh, opportunities to, to work in doing various um, analytical methods, um, a great supervisory team, very broad, so actually really building up a network. But, you know, it felt a bit like coming towards the end, it's like, oh, there's not much money in, in the Louisian and other kind of rather blue skies, as they would call it. Uh, research into into old rocks. And so I kind of then took a rather big sideways step in terms of the um, the kind of, of research that I then then did. So um, it's an interesting lesson, I suppose, um, for anyone who may be thinking about Korean research or maybe has family members thinking about doing this kind of thing, um, that a lot is luck in terms of timing and that kind of thing. So I find myself in a bit of a research dead end. You know, there wasn't much funding out there for doing a postdoc or, or things like that. Um, and I just happened to hear about this new technique called clumped isotopes. Clumped, it doesn't sound very technical, but some very clever isotope geochemistry to work out the temperature at which carbonate minerals grow. So, big jump going from silicate gneisses, zircons, deep earth stuff into very much more shallower, uh, shallower geology, looking at very different rocks, carbonates, in particular dollar stones, so limestones, which have um, been replaced with, with dolomites. And this was a very new field at this time. And so, you know, it's pretty hard to get a postdoc these days. Um, usually, you've got to have pretty good track records in whatever the subject is, like you did your PhD on that topic, you published some papers already, done neither of those things. But it was so new that nobody had any track record in this field. And I don't know, the stars aligned, got this postdoc, moved to Imperial College in London, and worked on this really great project. Uh, essentially, we were working out um, using this new technique to get a better handle on the thermal history 
of these dollarstone rocks in various locations around the world. Our samples were provided by the funder for this PDRA, which was Total, big French oil major. And we were essentially trying to work out and be more, more precise, more accurate in the thermal history of these rocks through geological time. These were kind of Mesozoic age and the, on the whole, sort of Jurassic kind of age. Um, and that was important for the oil company because it gave them a better understanding of the sort of geological evolution of their deposits and kind of impact of the geology on the oil and gas reservoirs. And so a lot of the stuff kind of did. Um, I felt, even though I was a research associate, kind of felt a bit like a technician some of the time, or an engineer. There was lots of, you know, going and doing, um, fiddling around with gas lines in the lab, that kind of thing. Um, using big mass specs where I was actually allowed to touch it and, you know, do lots of things, which I wasn't so much when I came here to use the iron microprobe. You know, there's the greenness of a PhD student, getting much more stuck into things and producing actually a very small amount of data for two years, but on a technique like this, which is very new, very advanced, it took about a day to make a measurement. Um, it's actually uh, quite a lot. And so, you know, we got some really nice data out of this um, in terms of thermal history, but also the fluid sources for um, precipitating the dolomite mineral in these rocks. Dolomite's very interesting in terms of oil and gas reservoirs because um, it actually increases the overall, the bulk porosity um, of the material. So that's good if you're looking for something that has oil and gas in it. So this is kind of my first uh, foray into carbonate rocks. And so that went really well, that was great. Um, it's funny, I'd always thought it'd be nice to be an academic. And I thought, oh, it'd be really nice maybe one day to go back to Glasgow, because that's where I did my undergraduate degree. And then, I don't know, again, the stars seemed to align, job came up. The um, head of school at the time was very interested in quantum isotopes. Our colleagues at, uh, at Zurich and East Kilbride had bought the right kit to do it. So a strategically useful hire, got myself in the door being like, oh yes, I've got all these great contacts in the oil and gas industry. I can get lots of great funding from them. As it so happens, uh, in between when I was offered the job and when I started, it was only about four months or so, the oil price crashed. Never really recovered to the levels it was in kind of 2013, 2014. And that oil and gas funding for carbonate research just sort of disappeared overnight, largely. But here I was, now an independent researcher, thinking, oh God, what do I do now? What do I do now? I've got to find my own money to do things, if I carve out my own research niche. And so kind of started to look, you know, sticking with this quantized dopes thing. It was kind of still cool at that time, you know, 2015, 2016 kind of time. Um, but working on different kinds of rocks. So I moved into a bit looking at um, calcite veins. So in both in ancient hydrothermal systems. So did some work. Um, collaborating with various folk, looking at some um, calcite veins from various locations across the Midland Valley of Scotland, Arran, uh, Ayrshire, um, those kinds of areas, uh, Renfrewshire as well, and looking to see if we could use a combination of this clumped isotope neat to work out temperature of the fluid flow, and then combine that with some uranium lead dating, which is what I'd done in Zirkins back in my PhD, but now doing it in this calcite, so working with uh, Nick Roberts at, uh, down in Nottingham and, and, and many others. Um, you know, we've got some really nice stuff about kind of pairing these techniques together to try and understand the thermal evolution, the fluid flow in these ancient hydrothermal systems. I also had the opportunity uh, through collaborators at Imperial to work with some colleagues in Taiwan where we looked at the same kind of thing essentially but in an active geothermal system. So that was a sort of nice thing to do. Um, but I was kind of looking around for other opportunities in the kind of carbonate rock space. And around this time, started thinking about carbonate rocks that form on the Earth's surface. So rather than things deep down, reservoir rocks, veins, things like tufas forming at the Earth's surface. So in the photograph on the right here, um, we can see behind the uh, dissertation student there, sort of rather muddy, mossy looking thing, but underneath that coating is a very nice example of a tufa. So essentially we're looking at carbonate deposits which have precipitated directly from surface waters. And we get these in 
um, places where we have a lot of limestone bedrock, interaction between the water and the bedrock, some dissolution of that bedrock, so there's a lot of CO2 held in solution in the water. But when you come to something like a waterfall, where we get lots and lots of turbulent flow, that then allows that CO2 to come out of solution and precipitate some carbonate minerals, forming a tufa deposit. And so, you know, kind of poked about at this um, a bit, this kind of thing, doing some of this clumped isotope measurement stuff. Yeah, it worked reasonably well, maybe slightly on the hot side. This example's from the Isle of Lismore in Argyll, a limestone island, so get quite a few of these very nice natural tufas forming. You know, I suspect the temperature of that water is not quite 20 degrees, um, maybe a bit less than that. Um, but, you know, we're kind of in, in the right ballpark, looking for new opportunities for using these different techniques that I'd gained experience in, in carbonates. And then a chance encounter. So much of that um, sort of serendipity in, in research. Our, the former um, director of research for my uh, department in Glasgow uh, introduced me to a colleague in uh, the School of Engineering at the University of Glasgow. He was sort of uh, interested in geothermal energy, um, various kind of water chemistry aspects, um, and told me about a very interesting site that I've been to uh, many times since. Um, so this is a uh, guy, Paul Younger, sadly no longer with us. You may have uh, encountered him. Very pleased to have uh, Will, one of my uh, referees, I think it was, for this award, come up to see who worked with, worked with Paul. Um, there was a great, there was a great, uh, I'm terrible for going off into little anecdotes and these kind of things. Sadly, it was before my time. I would love to have seen it. But when Paul joined um, the University of Glasgow, um, probably about 10, 10, 15 years ago, maybe, um, so he had a sort of chair, a uh, sort of fancy chair, the Kelvin chair of something or other, I think it was. I can't quite remember. Um, so there was a sort of inaugural lecture, you know, big new professor joined the department. Um, um, and... There was a bit, a bit like we had tonight, you know, a bit of a sort of chat, uh, you know, introductions, you know, um, talking about track record, things he'd done. And then, apparently, as like I say, I, I didn't see it, it would have been amazing to see, uh, Paul started his lecture with a Gaelic song. Um, so, a wonderful character. Um, and that, that happened to be about uh, a song that had been written about the Kruach and Hydro scheme. Um, very into these things. Anyway, sorry, I digress uh, with, a, with an anecdote. But essentially, um, Paul told me about this other tufa deposit, um, but of a very different type. So location at Consett in um, County Durham, northeast England, very well known for uh, steelworks um, from sort of late, mid, mid to late uh, 19th century um, through until around 1980. Um, so operational for a long time, and there was this kind of rather mucky-looking uh, tufa, sort of lots of tires dumped in the stream kind of thing, you know, not very pleasant, very fascinating, but not overly pleasant, but, you know, quite nice, quite well exposed, say, compared to the, to the one I showed in the previous slides, some really nice layering in it, we've got a kind of close-up of a, of a section here um, with some, some rather nice, nice layering, and it's a good chance to get in there and try and do some some detailed work uh, with this clumped isotope technique and you know other, other stable isotopes of, of carbon um, and oxygen, and essentially to see if you know could we maybe pick apart something in the stratigraphy of this deposit, you know, to tie this to some environmental um, environmental uh, parameters or or whatnot. Um, so this work was done by uh, Chris Oldsworth, uh, acknowledged in the first slide. We're pleased to see in the audience this evening, uh, current PhD student here. Um, at, uh, in the School of Geosciences. Um, so this was done in Chris's uh, MSc by, by research, so some fantastic, um, fantastic work done. And this kind of table here, I know there's a lot of numbers, let's maybe not dwell on these too much, but um, you know, we thought maybe the, the one in Lismore was slightly on the warm side. Temperature of the water, I mean, I know the northeast of England is reputed for, for being cold and its inhabitants being very hardy um, when they're out on the town. Um, but, you know, minus, minus 10 to minus 25, not so much, not so much. And so what we, essentially what we have here in this, this tufa is 
Again, a sort of surface carbonate deposit. This is formed in a very different mechanism to the one that I talked about on Lismore. So rather than sourcing the, the CO2 to go into making this tufa um, from carbonate bedrock, it's actually come from the atmosphere, and we can get a hint of that from this delta 13C column here. Notice these numbers are all very negative. They're quite negative in the grand scheme of things. Um, minus 15, minus 20, that kind of range. That's a sort of signal of atmospheric CO2 that has then been absorbed in to the stream water that we can see in the photographs here and gone into precipitating this, um, this tufa. And so the reason behind this and why this is here in the first place is something that I'd never really been aware of before, uh, and that is slag. Slag, I'll go on to, to talk quite a lot about this, but essentially in, in Consit, steel making town, waste product, slag, big legacy deposits of this, draining into this, this small burn, the Howden burn, um, where we find this tufa. And so this then kind of open up, opened up the world of slag to me, which then took me into the kind of more general world of uh, these anthropogenic geomaterials, which is kind of crux of what I'm going to be talking about this evening. So anthropogenic geomaterials, what, are, what do I kind of mean by this? Um, we can think of them as like sort of materials that are made of minerals, like rocks, but they've been not created naturally. They've been created wholly by some human process. And that's typically something involving a furnace and high temperatures. So, for example, with slag, when we make steel or, or just even iron, um, you know, we don't just go out and mine iron. You get iron ore, so a rock that's hopefully got a high proportion of iron in it. You then stick it in a furnace at a couple of thousand degrees with some additives, essentially to separate the iron out of that iron or rock that it was in. And once you've separated that iron out, that molten iron, everything else, so in the, in the original iron or rock, plus things like limestone that you add to kind of facilitate the reaction to get the iron separated, that then goes into making some slag. If you then take that molten iron, add some more things to make steel, you get more slag. So slag is essentially the byproduct from making iron and steel. You can create slag from anything where you're smelting things in a furnace, but for the purpose of what I'm talking about tonight, we're going to focus on um, slag from iron and steel making. So what is slag? What does it look like? This is a photograph of some slags. It's kind of fairly unassuming, kind of pale grey, rubbly, sort of gravel to cobble-sized material. Um, it's rich in calcium. Um, but that is in a form, a chemical form, which is unstable, chemically unstable, uh, at Earth's surface conditions. So the slag is made of minerals, um, which tend to comprise dominantly calcium, iron, aluminium, silicon, and oxygen. Um, the names of these minerals, you know, they're not they're not common not common in nature. We've got the melilite solid solution minerals, aconite, gilonite. Larnite, merbonite, lots of things were like, hmm, that sounds like a mineral, but hmm, I haven't really heard of that before. But actually, you know, volumetrically, these are probably surprisingly common because there is a lot of this stuff out there. Um, so kind of estimates are for global production of slag, byproduct from steel making, something about 500, 700 million tonnes annually. That's forecast to um, increase um, towards a billion by the end of the century, as you know, we're, we're, we continue to need uh, iron and steel for many purposes, construction and the like. It's been slag has been produced from iron and steel making since the industrial revolution. Um, through the years, and particularly more recently, you know, some of that has been reused, so it can go into perhaps a use as an aggregate for making roads or railway ballast, that kind of thing. Um, potentially also and sort of finding some increasing use as a substitute for ordinary Portland cement. So to make cement, that's a 
extremely, extremely CO2 intensive process, like emitting lots and lots of the stuff. So any kind of byproduct that we can use to offset some of that, to replace some of that, is is a good thing. So it's found um, an avenue for for reutilisation um, in that kind of context. But on the whole, you know, a lot of slag is just stockpiled, or dumped, even particularly if we go back in in time and during the industrial revolution, the 20th century. But a vast majority of, of slag um, was just discarded on the landscape. So some recent work um, then by uh, Alex Riley at the University of Hull, part of the Coastal Waste Project um, that I'm involved with, uh, essentially mapped out these legacy slag deposits around the UK and found that you know there's 100, about 190 million tons of this stuff just kind of lying about the place. Some of these are massive as well. This photograph here is from Workington uh, in West Cumbria. Uh, these cliffs are about 90 metres high um, at their highest point. Um, you can only see part of it here. All of that cliff is made of slag. So, you know, I mentioned this sort of a definition for anthropogenic geomaterials. I'm going to focus mainly on slag this evening. But just to mention some other thing, you know, what am I talking about when I'm when I'm talking about anthropogenic geomaterials? Um, other thing, you know, typically produced through um, industrial processes, so tend byproducts from those processes. So things like red mud, photograph in the top right from um, producing aluminium, paper mill waste um, from some kind of older methods of, of producing producing paper. Photograph in the bottom right. This is a deposit actually from West Lothian. Um, but also things like brick, cement, concrete, you know, these are all made of minerals. So they are sort of a geomaterial, as I would call it, and of course they're anthropogenic. These two photographs in the, the sort of bottom left here are actually from uh, the beach in Edinburgh, up at Granton, um, doing so, collaborating uh, with a PhD student uh, in Glasgow, doing some interesting work on how um, the influence of these anthropogenic geomaterials as opposed to natural um, beach pebbles and, and cobbles, what impact that's having on these kind of coastal geomorphology processes. You know, we can see the photograph um, here in the middle. A lot of this material is anthropogenic. Much of that is brick. And then the one on the left here, quite a rather spectacular beach deposit, some wonderful imbrication of these slags, uh, these slabs, sorry, slags on the brain, slabs of concrete. And so, you know, quite how these anthropogenic geomaterials influence um, coastal processes, really interesting um, avenue that we're, we're currently exploring. In terms of my sort of, I guess, personal interest, uh, research interest um, with anthropogenic geomaterials is at the kind of small scale, you know, so uh, I guess in my research, I've always done relatively small-scale things, um, be that zircongeochronology or the kind of isotope geochemistry stuff and very small uh, samples in, in dollar stones that I did in postdoc through to you know, veins, relatively small features and using uh, chemical and microscopy approaches um, to, to uh, answering problems, uh, questions um, in, with those kinds of things. So um, some work that we published uh, relatively recently on slag was looking at the kind of uh, what we call microstructures, so the kind of small scale textures of the way in which slag can then react with CO2 from the atmosphere, potentially as something we can use as a kind of carbon dioxide removal um, technology. And that's one of the, one of my main reasons um, for looking at slag is this ability to react uh, with CO2 and store it away. Um, and there's been a lot of, a lot of kind of research in, in, this, in this space, particularly looking at maybe more energy intensive approaches. So taking slag, grinding it up into fine powder, adding water, or batch reactors at high temperature, that kind of thing. All of these processes though, that in themselves potentially may emit a lot of CO2. But by doing some of this kind of microscopic uh, analysis of slags that have been sitting out in the landscape for decades, we can kind of see how they've reacted with the CO2 passively without any kind of human input and start to think about quantifying 
the amount of CO2 that's kind of just been passively locked away in the background. And so on the panel on the left here, um, we're looking at you know, a relatively small view from within a piece of slag. Um, so each of these kind of four panels that make up this, uh, this figure here are, what's that, about a millimetre and a half uh, across. Um, so we're looking at the microscale. But we can see some really nice reaction text, chemical reaction textures that evidence the reaction of the slag with um, CO2. So the top left here, um, a backscatter electron image. We can see we've essentially got three zones. There's this kind of speckly one at the top here that's generally fairly pale grey. There's then this sort of uniform grey zone here, um, which is our calcite. We've then got um, the black colour is just a pore. So we're looking at a pore, but we can see there's a zone in between the calcite and our brighter sort of fresh slag up here, which is a very kind of speckly mix of dark and white. And this is our evidence for the sort of textural evidence for leaching of calcium from the slag, reacting with CO2 and then precipitating calcite, calcium carbonate, directly on the surface of the slag. We could perhaps see that um, quite clearly in this orange coloured image here, panel B, in the top right of this uh, this four panel figure. The more intense orange colour is a higher concentration of calcium and the darker zone, you know, is still a bit of orange but that's a lower concentration of calcium where it's black, pore space, there's no calcium. So again we can see our, our <coughs> calcium carbonate, our mineralised CO2, high in calcium as we'd expect, our fresh slag, slag is calcium rich, yep, still, still pretty high in calcium but we've got this depleted zone in between them where Essentially, the surface of the slag, in this case going into a pore, um, the calcium has been leached out, reacted with CO2, and mineralized that in solid form. So this is a kind of chemical approach to um, understanding this, this process, um, so, so mapping out at a small scale uh, the distribution of different chemical elements, but we can also take a crystallographic approach um, to identifying different minerals, looking at the textures between them, and that's what we have in this panel, this figure on the right. So in this case, in the sort of top two panels, um, we have the sort of pink colour, which is a sort of fresh slag mineral. This sort of speckly yellow colour um, in it is our essentially our, our weathered slag, our leach slag, and then the, the sort of vivid blue, which you can see has this kind of microstructural lining pores within this piece of slag. That's our calcite, our mineralized CO2. Um, panels B and D down here, essentially, um, we were looking at sort of crystal, crystallographic orientations um, of the, this chemical reaction. Okay, maybe not so much um, to be learned um, from that particular um, process or that particular sort of processing of the data, I should say, but, but a combination of um, crystallographic and chemical approaches we were able to you know, really get into the details of this kind of microstructure um, of this slag carbonation reaction of, of slag with CO2. As well as doing that in two dimensions uh, on the scanning electron microscope, um, we've done some uh, work, this is mainly through a, a PhD student, uh, Glasgow Faisal, Faisal Kadur, who's actually coming to uh, join, uh, join you here in the, the School of Geosciences uh, in the new year. Um, Faisal did some incredible work with some 3D analysis using micro CT of this, uh, this same chemical process. So CT, a bit like a CT scanner in a hospital, same idea, but we're putting small, you know, solid materials in there. In this case, we're looking at small kind of cubic uh, or, or cuboid blocks of, of cut slag. And through some very clever image processing that I won't go into, I mean, slightly beyond me as well, to be honest. Um, essentially, processing this data to classify or segment the different phases at the microscale in 3D as well. So putting together a lot of data to reconstruct these sort of three-dimensional um, visualizations of this to look at the distribution within a 3D volume of, particularly in this dark blue color in, in plots B and D here, distribution of the calcite, the mineralized CO2, 
within our piece of slag. And so if you think about that, you know, that's actually really useful because you can then visualize, you know, how, how easy is it for the CO2 to percolate inside these particles? You know, how, how far is it going in? Is it coming up against some barriers that then stopping it coming in? What are the kind of controls, any sort of 3D structural controls on a reaction? Um, so kind of way to get at um, essentially understanding that 3D microstructure, that 3D distribution of CO2 that's reacting um, with the slag. This approach is actually non-destructive, which is rather nice because we can actually track the reaction in time between our CO2 from the atmosphere and slag because essentially what you're doing, you could take a piece of slag, maybe a fresh piece, put it out, wrap the atmosphere. Every so often, take that same piece, stick it in your CT, construct these maps, but you, that, that does not affect the sample, does not destroy the sample at all. You can put the same sample back out and keep that reaction going and you can track that through time, which is a really nice, um, really nice option with this, this approach. Oh, my little video animation has stopped. Uh, so, but uh, just another way of kind of visualizing um, the, the CD distribution, this sort of green thing on the right, that was hopefully going to essentially go all the way out and come back. Um, not so much, but we can kind of see uh, this green color essentially, anywhere that's green is calcite, which we've identified on the microstructure T. And so we can see these kind of circular or hemispherical shapes throughout. Um, and this is where the calcite is distributed throughout this block of slag, which is about, I don't know, about a centimeter cubed. Um, and, you know, again, some clever stuff um, that Faisal has done. You can essentially work out um, a tonnage of CO2 per volume of slag. So it's a good way to then, you know, quantify the opportunity, uh, the you know, opportunity to sort of scale um, for uh, drawing down carbon dioxide with, with slag. So to kind of then summarize um, this, this part of the, the talk, uh, I guess talking about, about slag, um, you know, kind of alluded to this reaction with, of slag with carbon dioxide um, quite a lot. Now essentially just to kind of summarize that with the, the diagram on the left here, essentially what's happening is where we have fresh slag, any surface that's exposed to air and water will then react with that water and the CO2 and then we see essentially a, a kind of uh, weathered zone developing in this kind of beige color um, which is an interface with the newly precipitated calcium carbonate which is our mineralized CO2 um, that it then forms on that, that outer surface. In terms of the kind of detail, detail of the chemistry of anyone's interest in that kind of thing, our calcium is leached out from this sort of outer zone, um, outer surface, or, or well, any surface, of the slag into kind of thin film of water on the surface. You can imagine, you know, slag lying out, lying out there in the landscape, rains here a lot, so there's plenty of scope for that reaction to happen. And then that, that sort of thin film of water with the calcium dissolved in it, potentially some kind of hydroxide as well, that then becomes very hyperalkaline. Um, even at a very small scale, just on the surface of these pieces, that, hyper that um, hyperalkalinity draws in the atmospheric CO2 and gases go through some chemical changes, hydroxylation, reacts with the dissolved calcium from the slag, and voila, we've pre precipitated some calcium carbonate, some calcite on the surface. And so this kind of 2 and 3D microstructural analysis trying to really kind of pick apart the, the microstructures of this reaction. So my main focus, I guess, of looking at slag has been uh, this kind of carbon dioxide removal, and sort of push for that kind of thing. It's, it's interesting, actually, um, in the UK and in Scotland, people talk about CCS, carbon capture and storage, and almost everyone automatically thinks, ah, yes, uh, a power station or a big factory, oh, a big CO2 source. Yes, we'll, we'll catch that and we'll put it in a pipe and we'll stick it out underneath the North Sea. Good. 
But it's very interesting to go to an international conference this summer and go to the CCS session, and hardly anyone was talking about that. Everyone was talking about mineralizing or reacting with CO2 with silicates. Uh, that could be natural rocks or industrial byproducts like slag. And so I guess just in terms of its, its sort of applicability, this would be smaller scale deployment of these kind of things that could be done in many more places actually has a lot more potential than the kind of very big engineered approaches with lots of infrastructure to pipe CO2 from a point source out underneath the North Sea, for example, into a depleted hydrocarbon reservoir. So that's kind of, I guess, my main, my main interest in, in slag is to that. But one thing I, I've found kind of amazing when I reflect on it is had I continued to look at natural rocks, I'm not sure I would have been able to collaborate with the number of different disciplines that I have by looking at something anthropogenic. So that, you know, there's slag has got, not just slag, anthropogenic geomaterials more generally um, have, you know, just kind of stick their tentacles out into so many other fields, you know. Um, botany, biodiversity has been a really interesting one. Um, two photos here of some slag banks. These are in, in northwest England. Um, quite a diversity of relatively unusual uh, flora and indeed fauna, particularly uh, in terms of insects, um, flourish with this slightly unusual chemistry of these materials, some rare plants, some orchids, um, that kind of thing. So botany has been a good one, but also kind of social science and humanities. Um, because it's a sort of, there's a link to industry, to sort of development, to deindustrialization, impacts on communities. It's really, there's been some really interesting kind of um, collaborations I've, I've been lucky to have with social scientists, humanities, human geography, um, those kinds of things. So that's been really interesting. And the kind of um, potential negative implications for uh, from anthropogenic geomaterials in terms of, of pollution, um, but potentially also resource recovery in terms of critical minerals, critical metals, things like vanadium or chromium. You know, there are reasonable concentrations in some of these materials. Not necessarily the easiest to process and extract them, but, you know, something to be thinking about as technologies in that kind of area um, improve. Okay. So on to the kind of final part of the talk now. So what I've been talking about so far there in terms of anthropogenic materials, I've been thinking about just like pieces. Yeah. You know, your, your average slag heap, not necessarily always, but will be a, like a pile of gravel. However, some kind of very recent work in the last couple of years that I've kind of got into um, a bit more is quite often we'll find these heaps of rather unassuming gravel converting into larger rock-like masses, essentially. So if we take slag as our example, our iron and steel making slag, reacts with CO2. Yep, we, we know that. Great. Um, but where, do, where, does that, where does that calcium carbonate sort of, where exactly does it precipitate? Okay, we saw it in some of the micro-CT data, the SEM data that I showed, um, in pores, lining pores, internal in a small particle of slag. But what if we look at that in a bigger scale? Outer surfaces of particles will also react, forming essentially mineral cement of calcium carbonate around the edges of particles. But if you've got a deposit of particles of slag, which are you know, reasonably well packed together, and you start mineralizing the gaps in between them, you're going to then fuse them together, you're going to lithify them, and essentially you've made a rock. We've had some interesting discussions actually recently about what is a rock? Does that count as a rock? It's a fundamental question. And no two people came up with the same answer. What is a rock? I mean, that's one to, one to think about, the, or there's a coffee uh, afterwards, or, or maybe in the next, uh, the next pizza and pot before your next lecture, you can have a think about, what, what, what is a rock? So um, 
a nice Scottish example where, that we published on just earlier this year of this phenomena uh, happening. This is a former ironworks at a place called Glen Garnock in North Ayrshire. Um, panel B here on the right, we essentially got a close-up kind of showing that. Um, it's, it's a bit sort of three-dimensional, but we can see the sort of greyish colour is our particles of slag. And then there's this sort of creamy brown sort of fringing sort of rims around all of these particles. And, but in three dimensions, that's enough to pull them together. The sort of distribution of the volume of that calcite cement is variable. This is a photograph from the field where we've got a sort of loch uh, here, Coburny Loch. Uh, the slag heap is, has actually been capped largely as a sort of remediation approach. It's got a clay cap and planted some willow trees on it. So that's just off to the right here, just the lake shore. Um, we can see there's a lot of this sort of cream color. And when we look at this using X-ray diffraction to identify the minerals, this is all calcite. So we've actually got quite a lot of calcite cement, but you can still see bits of the, the kind of gray slag poking up through that. And if we then look at this at the, the sort of micro scale, uh, again, back to the back to the SEM, same kind of similar style of, of figure with different panels, different chemical maps and images that I showed um, for the individual pieces of slag. We see the same kinds of thing where we have um, fresh slag, let's say that's not weathered, it's not been leached, it's not lost its calcium. So that's maybe this area. Let's go to panel D, we look in the sort of top left, great, it's a bit of orange, there's this kind of green stuff throughout that isn't really playing any part in that reaction. We've got this orange colour up here, high calcium concentration. And then get this zone on the edge of this clast, which is more purpley in colour, so it's kind of more silicon dominated, it's lost its calcium. And you can see that in a few of these different clasts here. And then all of these are joined together at the micro scale by this sort of uniform orange stuff here, which is our calcite cement. So we've got this same kind of weathering, leaching of calcium from the edges of slag class in our slag heap. And then reacting with CO2, which has been dissolved in the kind of water and precipitating calcite. In this case, it's a cement that's binding all of these particles together. Again, we can use isotopes, much like we did from the, the two-foot concept. We can use the same carbon, oxygen, oxygen, carbon and oxygen isotopes. Um, to sort of get a sense of where our CO2 that's going into the calcite is coming from. Same idea, you know, we're pretty close to an atmospheric end member, so the dominant component there is likely to be atmospheric. Another example in the panel on the left, I just quite like these pictures, to be honest, they're quite colourful, it's always quite nice. Um, catch the eye, same idea we've got Classes of slag, particles of slag. So that's kind of anywhere where there's a speckly green stuff throughout. I've outlined them in, in the white dashed line here. Um, again, they're sort of stitched together, joined together with this orange color, which is our, our uh, calcite mineral cement. So the diagram on the right then of these kind of four panels, um, so it just gives us a try and visualize a cartoon um, kind of way to understand just how this, you know, let's kind of summarize this process. So we had, we need some water. Now this slag heap was next to a loch, so kind of fluctuating lake level, chance of some water interaction, particularly if it's kind of ponding on the surface of the slag deposit, you know, some nooks and crannies in between the particles, uh, maybe a bit kind of infiltrating into the slag heap as well. So then you've got water there to react with the slag. It's pretty reactive. So we end up with these sort of calcium depleted zones around the edge. That calcium then gone off into be in solution in the water that's in between the particles. That then becomes really hyperalkaline, which causes the CO2 from the atmosphere to be sucked in. You've then got all the ingredients you need to precipitate calcite, which then fills in the gaps in among the slag. We don't just see this in slag as well. Um, done some work recently on a, a rather interesting anthropogenic geomaterial deposit uh, from a former cement works in North Lanarkshire. Um, essentially what we've got here is a sort of nicely layered um, deposit. We can see kind of nice layering in, in panels E and F here 
of this kind of gritty, granular material, um, which we then identified to be um, originally kind of cement that for some reason appears to have not made the grade for sale, so it's been dumped as a, as a waste product. Um, so it's been kind of granulated down into these granules, maybe not quite milled into the powder that you would buy in a bag of cement from the shop. Um, but it's been kind of granulated and it's kind of some other bits and pieces in there, bits of slag, bits of wood. Um, so kind of waste, waste cement. Um, sadly, this, this location is, is no longer there, which is rather nice, um, but it's, well, unfortunately it's now been, has a housing estate built on top of it. Um, well, that's quite good because then it means nobody could come along and disprove my ideas for this when they uh, uh, submitted to a, a journal, but not, not that I would ever do that. Um, so a different kind of material, but we see the same kind of lithification process. So originally this would have just been a kind of granular mass of sediment. But if we look at the microstructure, we can see the same kinds of, of textures. So the, the figure on the right is just an optical, uh, optical microscope transmitted light, transmitted light um, series of images. Essentially, we've got two main components. There's a kind of browny, grey, sort of cloudy stuff. And then there are these brighter bits, small crystals of a more transparent, light transparent phase. So what we have is that this, this lighter stuff, transparent stuff, is, is, is calcite. The dark, the sort of cloudy grey stuff is an alteration product from that primary cement. Essentially, the cement is reacted with water from this calcium silicate hydrate phase. Um, details don't really matter, essentially, but it's the microstructure. So again, we look at the panel and the... the Figure on the left here, same kind of scanning electron microscope series of images. If we look at the one in the bottom right, maybe very distinct um, partitioning between silicon and the purple color, calcium and the orange color. So the, basically where we have purple, we have this kind of cement phase and in sort of grains and then this sort of um, orange color indicating the presence of our calcite cement forming sort of rims around these particles and um, bonding them together, lithifying them together in a sort of larger rock-like mass. This diagram, so schematic diagram, just trying to maybe illustrate that a bit more clearly. So slightly more, slightly more complex chemistry going on because it's cement minerals. Don't need to do all the details necessarily, but we have a mix of stuff related to cement production, which is um, has been deposited. Some of that, the clinker, the cement minerals, they react with water very quickly, so they've changed phase, but it's still essentially a you know, kind of cement phase. And then we've had the leaching of the calcium from the particles, drawing in that CO2 from the atmosphere and precipitating calcite cement around the grains and bonding them together. So these two examples, the one from Glen Garnock with the slag and this one from North Lanarkshire with the cement waste, these are essentially just some, some waste that's been sort of like dumped and then that lithification has happened in situ where the material was dumped. But some recent stuff we've been working on actually suggests that we can get a sort of secondary lithification, sort of ex situ. So we come back to Workington in West Cumbria for this example. The photograph on the left here, this kind of, these, these cliffs, that was the same cliff that I showed a photograph of earlier, they're kind of quite big deposits of all slag. Um, you can see on top, so sort of grassy, this sort of yellowy color. But there's, you're very exposed to the Irish Sea here. So there's been a bit of erosion, got these cliffs forming. So some of that slag has been eroded by the waves. And as we would have with any any, any geological material, if you erode that with waves and you're on a beach and those eroded particles are rolling around, you're knocking off the corners, lots of impacts, you're going to round those particles off quite a bit. And so if we then look at the beach in front of the slag deposit, so kind of in the foreground of the photograph here, all of the pebbles are quite rounded. You know, fair enough, expect that from um, a sort of beach deposit. But actually it's not really a beach. There's not many loose pebbles because 
almost all of what you can see on the beach here is one solid layer of rock. Now this is out on the shore beyond where the slag was ever deposited. And yet, when you look closely at this rock, photograph on the right, all of the clasts in that are made of slag, almost all of them. There's the odd one you can maybe see in the photograph on the left here, there's a brownish colour, that's the St. Bees sandstone, the, sort of the local geology. But the vast majority of those clasts are you know, rounded, but certainly sub-rounded clasts of slag. And there's no arguments, this is rock. You, know, you can't just like pick up a pebble. That's it, it, to all intents and purposes, from a, from a distance, it looks like a natural sedimentary rock, a breccia or a conglomerate. But this is wholly anthropogenic. Well, wholly anthropogenic? There's certainly anthropogenic influence. All of these clasts are anthropogenic geomaterials. However, they've been eroded, transported, deposited, and then lithified naturally. And the mad thing is, this slag heap where they originally came from is like no more than 150 years old. That erosion is a few decades, kind of thing, maybe 50 years max. So we've all gone all the way around the sedimentary cycle, erosion, transportation, deposition, and we've lithified the deposit into a rock in like decades, which is kind of mad when you think about forming natural rocks in a subsurface, millions of years, you know, kind of thing. Just to try and prove this, um, you know, this is, this is the, the, the photograph here is kind of a macro scale thing, which is a pretty big class. But if you look in between these larger slag classes, this is kind of more gritty looking um, sort of stuff, slightly different color. You know, what actually is in that? What's the mechanism of lithification here? These are, again, some electron microscope chemical maps. Um, this is super new. I actually only extracted these from the software today, so I haven't actually updated the. Um, scale bar, but essentially this is probably about a millimetre, a few millimetres across. So even in the very fine stuff between the large clasts, what we're seeing here is all these coloured bits, the pinks, the, gre the greens, the purples, the sort of some little sort of peach colours, these are all slag. And you can see these particles, you know, they're not spherical, but they've got rounded edges on the whole. So that, again, evidence that we've had some erosion. And once again, same color scheme, we've got these orange zones indicating our calcite cement um, just joining, fusing these slag particles together. And so this has come from that sort of beach platform rock. And so this rock is formed in, yeah, sort of decade scale. So super modern, super fast geological processes. I've seen this at one place in Scotland as well. Um, I think there's probably quite a lot of this out there to be found. Maybe people just haven't been looking. If anyone among you goes out looking at random places on the beach kind of thing, seeing interesting things, if anyone's seen anything like this, please do come and tell me. I'd be very interested if you know any good locations of this kind of thing where various anthropogenic wastes have been deposited, particularly on the shore, and are found in these kind of bigger rock-like masses. This is from Stevenston in North Ayrshire, so a nice Scottish example, exactly the same thing happening. We can see in the photograph on the right, perhaps a bit more clearly, our sort of very large slag clasts there with this kind of cementing material in between. Again, it's that, it's that calcite cement. So, um, I guess we've gone on a little bit of a journey there from some very old things, about as old as you can get in the UK, to I would challenge you the newest rock in the UK. You know, we don't have volcanoes, so we don't have lava flows, but I think this is the next best thing in terms of the very newest geology that we can have here in Scotland and in the UK. So then maybe just to kind of summarise um, some of the things then um, that I've been talking about this evening, this idea of anthropogenic geomaterials, these kind of mineral, mineral materials, but that are created by humans, usually in a furnace, usually as a byproduct from industrial processes. They offer us various opportunities, so the kind of carbon dioxide removal that I've majored on, but also things like resource recovery um, and biodiversity enhancement. They pose some challenges too, particularly through... Um, pollution, but then 
kind of laterally, then I've talked about, well, rather just thinking about these as deposits, what about if they actually become rocks? We can see that happening. And so with ever-increasing production of these materials, byproducts from other materials like steel that we really need, and we're not going to stop needing, so we're going to be we're continually adding to the volumes of these things, these anthropogenic geomaterials that are out there in the landscape. You know, we've shown that these things can lithify super rapidly, and so perhaps then, as we look into the geological future, the future rock record, you know, maybe these kind of things are going to be playing a bigger role, becoming more prevalent in, in the rocks of the future. So with that, I will uh, finish, and uh, thank you very much for your attention.